So I think I need to share my screen. So today's talk is going to be on my personal experience and perspective of using Peronius Longus autograft as a primary graft for ACL reconstruction. I am Dr. Karthik Raj Kuberakani, consultant arthroscopy shoulder and knee surgeon practicing in Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu. At the outset, I would like to thank the Indian Arthroscopic Society for giving me such an opportunity to present my perspective on Peronius Longus. Now, before understanding the techniques and other things, we need to answer three questions. Why are we looking at a graft apart from the time-tested graphs available for ACL reconstruction? Now, why? once we understand the answer to why, we move on how to do that, mastering the technique like Bruce Lee in giving a single punch, so which works out with an excellent functional outcome. Also, the third most important question is patient selection. Are we going to do for everyone or do we have a specific criterion in patient selection for utilizing Peronese longus? Now, looking at the time-tested graft options, we have the two pillars, the autographs and the allografts. Now, in the Indian perspective, allografts go off. We are left with autograft options. Now, the two most common graft options available are the BTB, bone patella tendon bone graft, and the quadruple hamstring grafts. Now, we all know the advantages and disadvantages of both the graphs. Going on to BTB, especially used in athletes, since a better and a faster bone-to-bone -bone healing is achieved. On the other side, the disadvantage being a fixed length of the graft available, and also the graft tensile sen found to be inferior to the native ACL. The most other important disadvantages is a huge incision or a relatively huge incision, even though we use a mini open technique and the anterior knee pain associated with athletes and people across some parts of the globe where kneeling is an important day-to-day -day activity. Now that made us to move to the commonly used hamstring grafts utilizing the gracilis and the and or plus or minus the semitendinosis, which is quadrupled. Now in the Indian, now most of the Asian scenario, it is always that we need to utilize both the tendons to do the grafts. Now we all know the hamstrings, especially with active athletes involving the pivoting activity of the knee, does have a major role in pivoting. So we always stay in a question of knocking them off in terms of grafting. And also, there has been reports associated with knee pain in the anterior following graft. And there have also been reports of loss of sensation, especially with knocking off the infrapetellar branch of saphenous nerve. Now, with all these options in mind, as an orthopedic surgeon, we are always in constant search or in demand of something else. Now, what else? Is Peronius Longus new to the field of orthopedics? No. We have always been using it for a number of other options, starting with deltoid reconstruction, MPFL reconstructions, especially the anterior half or the anterior bundle of the Peronius Longus, and also with procedures concerning ankle instability repair. Now, what are these journals going to tell us? The number of journals talking about the functional outcome, the biomechanical aspect, and they do give us promising outcomes. Now, the next 15 or 20 minutes of my talk would be concentrated on making you understand 
the technical perspective, the biomechanical perspective, and my personal experience, which made me change to peroneus longus as a primary graft. Now, what is our experience? We have a case series consisting of 154 patients, all primary isolated ACL reconstructions. Yes, plus or minus meniscal work, but not considering multiligamental injuries. Predominantly males, female on a lower ratio, age group 30 plus or minus 10. And we have a longest follow up measuring to two, three years, short, and the minimum follow up of more than one year. Now let's run you through my learning curve journey, starting with the technique of harvesting. Before going on to the harvesting, we need to have some landmarks clean to us to give us a clear view of graft harvesting. Now what are the pictures showing us? The picture on the left side is a surface marking showing the lateral malleoli, the fibula, distal fibula. Now what we need to understand is that the peroneus longus and the brevis, the two brothers here, are enclosed in a compartment of synovium in the retro malleolar tunnel, which extends approximately four to three centimeters from the distal tip of the fibula. You see here? Now, what is important in this understanding where to start the incision, especially to make the incision as small as possible. So now what I'm trying to palpate here is you can palpate very easily that in the retromalleolar region, it is more of a single bundle. And to make it advantage while taking the foot into plantar flexion, you can see the point where I'm trying to palpate, beyond which you see the tendon splitting or coming out of the tunnel. You can also see in terms of reflection. Now, to make it simple, I always follow the rule of three finger technique. Three finger breath, starting from the distal mode part of the fibula, is the point where the two brothers, longus and brevets, come out of the tunnel, and that is where you need to put your incision. Now, this is a mini open technique that I follow where the incision size is very less than one centimeter, hardly seven to eight mm. Now this is, now to make it very clear, the size of the incision is definitely not important. The more important is the functional outcome, but as our learning curve goes through, it makes, gives us a better understanding of the anatomy, thereby helping us to get the tendon harvesting done through a very small incision, causing less trauma, better pain relief, and earlier patient rehab and back to play. Now here, I illustrate the landmarking done over the distal fibula, showing you the distal most tip of the fibula through a vertical line there. And I've also drawn the retromalleolar tunnel where I don't want. And as I told you, my three finger breadth landmark is where I put my seven to eight mm skin incision. Now, once the skin incision is made, carry out a blunt dissection, and immediately below are the two brothers. Let's go on to the next video. Now, these are the two brothers here. What I'm showing is the more superficial and behind one is the tendinous peroneus longus. And you can see a well demarked and anterior lying in front. Let me play the video again. So this is the peroneus longus, tendinous, and behind anterior is the more fleshy muscular peroneus brevis. Now this identification is the most important step of harvest. This can be done through a very small incision. Once it is done, the next step is taking whip stitches on the longus. Now you could see me utilizing two right angle arteries. The longer one, the larger one is having the longest clinged on and the smaller one is below the peroneus brevis. Now I would tell you the reason why I'm doing that. Now I've started to take some whip stitches 
over the distal most part of the longus just above the retromalleolar tunnel. Now this whip stitches would help us a good grip especially while using your tendon stripper for harvesting. I use the Chinese finger stitch mechanism going retro. A couple or maximum a three stitch would be fine. So getting both the threads in alignment is important to get a uniform pull. Yes, this is the uniform pull you need to get. Otherwise, it might result in shearing of the tendon. Now, next video is also important where we do a tenodesis stitch using a non-absorbable or a delayed absorbable material. Now, now, this is where I want you to understand the reason of using two right angle arteries. The first right angle artery has the longest tendon used for the whip stitching. The second has both the tendons. Now we take a tenodesis stitch. I always like taking a loop stitch. So one stitch into, one stitch back. And you can observe that. I go for a second loops here. This is the second stitch back forth to create a kind of a circumferential loop and a sturdy tenodesis stitch. Now the question of whether the stenodesis stitch is a day necessity is not being tested because we have journals and paperwork telling even without a stenodesis stitch, the functional outcome stays unaffected. But in my personal regard, I always find it comfortable going ahead with a stenodesis stitch. Once that is done, I'm sorry, I'll mute the video. Yeah. The important stuff is just doing the tenotomy above the tenodesis stitch. Now you can see that nice and clean. Now the other trick that I use is utilizing a long curved scissors and running it across the skin and fascia above the longest. Now that helps me clear or blunt dissecting before I put a tendon stripper. So that prevents the chance of any premature amputation of the tendon. The last one is the harvest. I used a closed one second. Let, let me mute the audio. Yeah. So close tendon stripper, pushing the tendon stripper across and giving a gentle pressure over the whip stitches. The other important is the upper limit. I go around four to five centimeter below the head of fibula to avoid any nerve injury. So the other technique I use is I ask my assistant to place the hand there. So I make him sure that my tendon stripper does not cross the limit. And this is how a nice, fleshy, bulky tendon after the good harvest. Now, looking onto the lens, uh, we always find a peroneus longus tendon not less than 240 mm to go it goes to up to a limit of 300 mm now what is more interesting is the length of the tendon and the thickness stays relatively same not much of a variation with respect to anthropometry of the patient and also the sexual dimorphism of the patient now this is not a perspective with respect to the hamstring tendon. We see a lot of variations, especially correlating with the anthropometry and the thigh circumference. In regard, the peroneus longus, we always get a harvest length of 240 to 300 mm, which when doubled or we triple it, gives to a thickness of minimum of 8.5 to 8 to around 10 to 10.5 mm. So average is what 9 to 9.5 mm thickness, which is a good sturdy graph that you're comfortable operating on. Now, once that is done, I'll quickly run you across the arthroscopic uh, video of how I do the ACL using the peroneus longus. It's no different than the normal ACL. Now, this is the kind of view I love having on my viewing portal, clearing off I like clearing off and skeletonizing the lateral wall of the intercondylar notch, making me a clear view of the posterior and the anterior limits. I love following the skeletal landmarks of the bifurcate and the residence ridge. Yeah. 
yes once that is done yes what i am a strong follower and believer of dr andrew pearls the concept of ideal femoral tunnel now what does that stand for isometric direct fibers eccentric anatomic and low tension point now that is as simple if you see at the diagram before i play the video it's as simple so you have the notch here lateral valve of the notch here so that this is the bifurcate ridge you tend to stay so you know the ideal graph tunnel position is going to be on the black circle which is just behind the bifurcate ridge on the anterior or the higher part so let me show you my video this is where so you you can see the bifurcate ridge well and clear just behind the ridge and high up is the point i always like going ahead once that is done we start the pilot hole with 4.5 mm tunnel also simultaneously measuring the tunnel which is normally on a 40 to 45 mm tunnel once that is done we go ahead with the graph tunneling incorporation which is usually in this case i think a 9.5 mm tunnel i always like to have a 25 to 30 mm socket for the graft incorporation i like to clear the soft tissue this is the kind of view i love to have um with the soft tissue cleaned a neat tunnel there yes this is the tunnel within the tunnel the inner tunnel being 4.5 outer being 9.5 mm tunnel you can see that oily droplets there which are Uh, potential growth stimulants the next is the tibial preparation my landmark is very simple i follow the stump i do something called the stump cutting uh, i don't want the stump to be too much closing and cyplox lesion at the same time i don't want to knock up and bald off the tunnel entirely blunting off all the proprioception so that's what i called a stump shaving or stump cutting to trim it off to be neat on its head now the landmark is one i use is the uh, stump per se i always use a elbow reamer the other landmark is the antero posterior landmark is on par with the anterior horn the posterior border of anterior horn of the lateral meniscus and on the medial lateral plane i want to be more on the 40th percentile of in between the uh, both spines tibial spines so again it comes there we have the we have the first guide pin and the tunnel of 9.5 mm now on the femoral side i'm a strong believer of adjustable loop so this is the graft shuttle that happens there once it is done you can see the ultra button snugging through the femur now that's more important i like pulling the ultra button in a very viewed fashion that helps you know that helps preventing the sudden swick off of the ultra button getting stuck into the soft tissue now let me show you this is uh, you know this is what the image i always love to look at through the tunnel where i can see the ultra button placed flush with the uh, femoral cortex i think you will see in a minute you see the you can visualize the ultra button sitting flush with the femoral cortex we are doubly sure there is no soft tissue in between on the tibial side yes i love aperture fixation with the biosure screw or anything of the surgeon's preference now this is the end of the graft that has been put back after using the peroneus like you can see the nice bulky flushy graft which is a 9.5 mm graft in place so i always fall in love with this kind of view after peroneus longus graft now that's end of the surgical technique let's quickly go on to the highlights now what makes me over the last 3 years i've completely shifted more than 95 of my practice for primary acl is utilizing peroneus longus graft now what makes it happen easy harvest not to mention a very small skin incision you can see here hardly three staples it's less than a centimeter believe me your patient especially in athlete if at all in cosmetic perspective 
is hardly going to be seeing the graft because it's a retromalleolar zone that you're going to put your incision. The incision automatically goes in for cover, not to be easily seen, and it's very small incision. And donor side morbidity. Now, there are a number of journals quoting on the ankle function does not get affected, starting from the work of Dr. Bansha. Now, what we learned in our own experience, of course, the data is unpublished. The initial two to three months, yes, there is a slight decrease in ankle power, which is four plus, four plus, I won't say it more. The end of three months could rehab. I've seen all the patients having ankle aversion power of five cross five. Now, the other argument is the peroneus longus has an important role of first ray plantar flexion and maintaining the arch. So now this, does it have a role on the stance phase of gait cycle? Now, there are a good number of journals quoting this function is predominantly taken care by peroneus brevis. And the other important thing is that we do do a tenodis stitch there. Now, what shows that? We have been lucky enough, of course, Dr. Bansha has showed in a study, we have also had been lucky enough to have around, in a, in a patient sample of 154, we have got around 35 of our patients who have gone through MRIs at the end of one year and two years, which interestingly shows us regeneration of the tendon. Now, that's interesting. So that may be the reason explaining excellent outcome with no I would literally say no ankle comorbidities, you know, comorbidities or no ankle donor site morbidities. And the other important is that with such a thick and bulky graft, I am more confident of an accelerated ACL rehab program. Now that is me testing the ankle power. Com completely normal. Sorry for the sound. So now the three important enhanced graft perspectives or the properties is the tensile strength. We know the biomechanical studies show peroneus longus in a doubled fashion as a tensile strength of 2,500 newtons, which is far superior than the native ACL. Now, the bulk of the harvest invariably has a graph size of 8.8 .8 plus or minus 0.7, which is also the similar issue in our experience. Now, graft diversity, as I told you, does not, the properties of the graft does not vary much with the anthropometric and sexual dimorphism of the patient. Now, any good thing comes with a bit of price. Do we have some contraindications? Yes. Flat foot, a lateral ankle instability, and in patients with, of course, you know, fixed ankle deformities, polio, on the rare bit is one we do not look at taking the peroneus longus graft. Now, as I had already told you, we are also we also have some studies showing comparison of the tensile strength, and we are ourselves doing some studies it to be published. Now, what is the net perspective? Is that we find the peroneus longus, if not superior, to be same or slightly better in tensile strength compared to the hamstrings and also the native ACL. This may not be statistically significant in some perspective, but if you look down to the narrow cross perspective of the values, they do have a better tensile strength with regard to the hamstrings and the native ACL. So why not? Peroneus is better in all the perspectives, starting from the graft harvest, lesser graft donor site morbidities, a good thick bulky graft in situ, especially in the Asian population, you get a uniform thick graft, which gives me a thick eye of 9 to 9.5 mm, tensile strength better, easy and fast, better rehab. Now, what does my patient say? This is a patient, of course. I want to mute it again. Now, he's a national football player. This is his fifth month follow up videos after I don't think any one of us would be able to easily identify which was the sign operated. So he's doing all the biomechanically pivot shift activities of the knee, starting from duck walking to squatting and semi squat balancing. He's very comfortable on that. Now, this is the kind of confidence 
the peroni as long as grieves me. Okay, to put it in nutshell, my experience, yes, I've completely shifted out to peroni as long as as a primary graft utilization in all the patients except in the few contraindications. We have been fortunate enough to have quite a good load of patient who have been the native kabaddi players. Now, kabaddi is a sport which is, I think, rank, can be ranked one in a contact sports. So I am, I've been fortunate enough to have a good follow-up as well, longest follow-up, three years with Peroni as long as on these patients, subset of patients. What I find interesting is almost all of them having a very good functional outcome. And I feel confident one step more than utilizing the peroneus longus. In fact, I feel confident of a BTB without having the donor side morbidities or morbidities of the BTB while utilizing the peroneus longus graft. So, uh, so I think this is what the message I would like to tell my the audience is. The peroneus longus can be a well-utilized graph in all perspective, in especially our Indian population. And this will especially function a role in epaulets involving the pivot shift activities of the knee, wherein you have a little bit toss on utilizing the hamstrings, which do a, play a role in those things. Now, what does this interesting study show? I wanted to put you across comparing peroneus longus and hamstring group. Apart from the good functional outcome in both the groups, of course, statistically not significant. If you look at the figures here, this is the peron hamstring group and this is the peroneus. Statistically, both are functionally good, not much difference between. But if you look at the numbers of the scores, this is on the 88, the upper end of 80s, and this is on the 90s. So there is a uh, quantity, I mean, may not be a qualitative, but a quantitative difference, though not statistically different. Now, what is more important that pulled me across, and it coincides with our study as well, is the thigh circumference or the thigh wasting. Interestingly, the predominant hamstring group falls into a thigh wasting of more than 10 mm. And the predominant 70% of peroneus longus, the thigh wasting falls in less than 10 mm. Now, what does this say? Now, this says in the post-operative rehab group, utilizing the peroneus longus, we are going to encounter less amount of thigh wasting, a better hamstring balancing, uh, indeed resulting in a better biomechanical balance between the quadriceps and the hamstrings. So that makes me more confident in pushing towards peroneus longus as a primary graft early rehab and especially in athlete athletes thank you i hope this talk of mine would have thrown some light on understanding and the technical perspectives of utilizing peroneus longus and once again i would love to thank indian arthroscopic society down from my heart for giving me this opportunity an excellent platform to share our experience and knowledge.